It's Nicola here with an update on our emergency appeal for people fleeing Myanmar. And this afternoon, I'm joined by Madara from Christian Aid. Madara is Christian Aid's head of humanitarian programs in the region, and she's just got off the plane from Bangladesh this morning and come straight here to tell us about what she's seen. So, Madara, welcome. Thank you, Nicola. And you've just come back from Cox's Bazaar this That's morning. Right. Um, so Yes, I was there for a week. We've got local partners and uh, local staff there, just visiting some of the camps and seeing um, how we could support uh, the displaced families. So in the media reports, you know, we've heard about this place called Cox's Bazaar. Can you tell us exactly where it is? So when people um, flee Myanmar, they cross the border into Bangladesh and Cox's Bazaar is where they come to. And over the last several weeks, we've seen uh, num people just flock to Cox's Bazaar. Now the numbers are over just 500,000 and increasing. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Even the day I was in the camps, there are new families coming in. Um, and seeking safety and, and shelter. Mm. So it's a, it's, a, it's a region on the other side of the it border is, yes, from Myanmar. Is. And then one other thing that I've read in um, lots of reports, and I've seen some really seasoned journalists say that it's one of amongst the worst things they've ever seen. It's as bad as it gets. Was that your experience when you got yes, there? Yes, even um, after 15 years of going into disaster zones, this was incredible scale of just the um, displaced families with very little information. They don't know what's going to happen next. They need food, shelter, water sanitation and health support. Mm -hmm. And when I was standing in the camps, just as far as the eyes can see, whichever way I turned around, it was just these makeshift um, houses, mm -hmm. makeshift shelters and families just waiting for their next meal and the kind of, yeah, it's really difficult, desperate situation. Yeah, I mean, the scale is really difficult to understand. So, for, and from what I understand, people are coming across from Rakhine State in Myanmar and they're crossing this border area. Are they camping immediately on the other side of the border or are they moving further in? What's happening in their, their journey from Myanmar into Bangladesh? It's different points in the border. So some uh, take the boats um, and then they cross. Um, some of the families that I spoke to, it took them, from when they left Myanmar, 14 days to get to um, safety in, in, in Bangladesh. Others, uh, 24 hours. And, um, and they've taken boats, trucks, trekked for days, barefoot, carrying their small children and elderly parents with just nothing but the clothes on their back. Uh, it's a really difficult, um, arduous journey for them. Mm. And how are they getting across the land from where they were in Rakhine State? Are they are there long columns of people walking by day? Do they have to go by night? What, what's the situation? But, so we've heard of long columns of people um, coming together in, in, in clusters and groups. Um, and this elderly lady, she said about her son dying, um, and she's got small grandchildren, five of them, daughter-in-law pregnant, and she said she didn't have a chance to mourn her son being um, lost. So she paid a lot of money, a steep price, 73 uh, US dollars to get a boat across. And she talked about hiding um, during the day, um, hiding in the bushes and then walking at night. Um, so very difficult journey. And now that they're in camps, although there's that immediate sense of safety and, mm -hmm. and security, they don't know what next. So aid agencies like Christian Aid and other DC member agencies are really working together mm. to scale up, to respond. Mm. Yes, and so I understand that the needs are absolutely great. And you've touched on something I've seen a lot in media reports that, I mean, people are fleeing um, and, and, and in fear. And the one thing they do have when they get onto the other side, I've seen lots say, is that at least they don't have to fear for their lives. They feel safe, but clearly the conditions, you know, when they had poor lives before, mm. but at least, you know, they had a normal, ha uh, they had their mm. house, they had an income, there was food on, yeah. on the table for their children, and now they've come to this situation where they have nothing. Tell us more about what Christian Aid, which is one of DEC's um, 13 member charities, are going to be doing. Well, we're already um, working with our partners to provide medical support. Um, families, uh, there's small children with diarrhea and, and skin diseases, they have unhygienic conditions in the camps, and as, as they walked across, um, so that is an urgent, urgent support that we are providing. Um, and when I say medical camps, it's just a small tent where doctors and paramedics, nurses are providing uh, um, that support. And we're also working with our local partners to provide food, uh, shelter, um, and 
hygiene kits and things like sanitation mm. napkins and, and mugs and buckets for people so that at least they have basic mm. um, household items. And you're giving that aid already? We yes. are, we are already, um, but the needs are so high and it's so um, important to just scale up our responses mm. um, collectively. This is providing, meeting their practical needs as well as providing them information. There's an information ga um, gap and they mm -hmm. don't know what's going to happen next. Uh, they don't know who's coming in and when their next meal mm -hmm. is. Um, so we need to collectively provide that information while we're meeting yeah. their physical, um, urgent and basic needs. And how many people are Christian Aid planning to help? Uh, initially, we talked about 64,000, mm. but that's just um, mm. immediate support. But we will scale up and we will ramp up our uh, response to really make sure this is, is not going to end in the next month or so. Mm. So we need to think through the medium term. Um, my team on the ground are saying the rains, even though when I was there, it was blazing hot. In the next few months, it'll be rains again. And in these hilly conditions, it means landslides and flash floods. Mm. So we need to make sure that the families are in, in safe um, shelter areas and that they've got the tools to withstand uh, what's coming next. Yeah, exactly. And tell us, um, what are the, the DEC is made up of 13 um, member charities, which include organisations like Save the Children, Oxfam, British Red Cross and of course uh, Christian Aid. Are they coordinating with each other? Absolutely. So when I was there, um, I was working with uh, colleagues from CARE and Action Aid, TIA Fund, to really make sure that we're talking to each other. We mm. all work with local partners. Mm -hmm. Bangladesh has a really fantastic civil society. Mm -hmm. So we need to make sure that we work with each other and work with its local partners to boost their capacity. Um, I, I, that it's so mm. important and DC agencies work well together mm. and we, we do well responding to crises like this. Yes, and I mean, one of the things about the DEC is that um, when you donate your money, and because the, our members are long-standing members and we, we know exactly how they're going to be spending the money, um, as soon as you've donated the money, immediately after an appeal, we'll be spending it right now. It'll be being spent immediately. So it is already being spent. Mm -hmm. And as Madara said, the needs are great. But before we talk about what people can donate to, I wanted, you know, you've been doing this work, as you said, for 15 years. Did what, when you saw it, did, did it shock even you or, or have you seen it all before? No, I think every disaster is different um, mm -hmm. and this was, I think it, it kind of broke my heart a little bit because I was in Myanmar in March, I was in Bangladesh mm -hmm. in March and now to see this um, and thinking back to the families I met in Myanmar and wondering where mm -hmm. were they and what, how, if they were safe, um, I don't think any seasoned aid worker, no matter how long mm -hmm. you do it, it things like mm -hmm. that still is, is gut-wrenching and, and mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, that is really terrible. I mean, as we say, those people were poor, but they didn't need to flee and be in this desperate situation. And that really is what the DEC is all about, coming together at a time of great humanitarian need, especially those that people weren't expecting that have come out of the blue. Um, you know, people have been forced to flee and, and, and they weren't anticipating it. And now they're stuck in this dreadful, dreadful situation, as Madara has explained. So we've got, um, as always, you know, we, the, the British public are incredibly generous and this morning we, you know, we announced that we had already raised £5 million. Um, but we still need much more money to come in, as Madara has explained. So £30 could provide one family with shelter, £50 could provide 10 families with the hygiene kits that Madara spoke about, and £100 could feed two families for a month. So please do keep on giving. And if you do give over the next few days, the government will still match your donation pound for pound. So you really can double your donation. Thank you so much, everybody, and we'll see you again tomorrow.